has always been a game series that's caught my eye. I don't know if you've noticed, but nostalgic looking JRPGs are exactly my cup of tea. Regrettably, I've tended to have bad timing with them. By the time I find one of the titles, it's usually already received the US release date or is slated to well before I can make a video on it. And uh, yeah, playing shit that you can already play in English is not what this channel's about. So when Yeast 9 came out with only tentative plans for a US localization, I knew it was time to shoot my shot. So let's go ahead and dive in with Yeast 9. Probably didn't miss anything important in one through eight, right? Probably. It's, pro it's fine. It's fine. We're good. It's fine. Our story begins with long-standing yeast protagonist Adol in Medius Res. Or for those of you who aren't stuck-up film snobs, we begin in the middle of the action at some point in the future because the actual beginning is so boring you'll want to staple your scrotum to your thigh. We join Adol as he rolls into Bulduk, a massive fortress of a city famous for its prison. And like any unremarkable tourist trap known for its underwhelming man-made attractions, the locals waste no time finagling you into a visit. <coughs> well, shit. So Adol is thrown into a questionably spacious cell only to immediately bust out for pretty much no other reason than the plot demands it. While we find out later that he did spend a reasonable amount of time locked up, <laughs> we can't let that get in the way of playing through our epic prison escape. And by epic prison escape, I mean he pretty much just walks out. All these guards seem relaxed for there being an anime protagonist on the lamb. God damn. Halfway through our Shawshank reenactment, we are intercepted by Apelis, a goth waifu who gives us magic abilities by shooting us in the face? Upon reviewing the footage, I'm uh, pretty confident the events of this game are some wild hallucination of Adol's as he bleeds out in the sewer. The magic gunshot wound transforms Adol into the Red King and grants him an array of magic powers. Well, I mean, I say magic powers, but the game insists on calling them a curse. And I insist on calling bullshit. The Red King has access to all manner of traversal and combat capabilities that far exceed those of normal plebs. The only real curse to be found is that disgusting ass rat tail. Huh? 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 Uh, uh, can you just, just, just shoot us again? Right in the face. I'll take it. I'll take it all. Oh my god. Hallucination or otherwise, we make our way out of the famously inescapable prison like it's an Elder Scrolls tutorial. Hey, you. Then are introduced to the game's titular Monstrum, a group of other individuals cursed with powers by up release. She uses you all to combat the looming threat of the grim world and the demonic creatures that lie within. From here, Adol spends the remainder of the story delving into the secrets of Bulduk and the grim world while identifying and recruiting each of the Monstrum. The interesting thing about the Monstrum is that while they all come together when summoned to fuck shit up in the grim world, it's not like they're a cohesive team. They're each purely autonomous, using their powers as they see fit. Some act as Robin Hood-esque redistributors of wealth, while others just seek to satiate their revenge boners. Unraveling each of their stories and seeing what these individuals do with the incredible power gifted to them was compelling to me nearly on the level of Mass Effect 2. Their introductions aren't always subtle, though. When we first meet White Cat, she runs into us when Adol is examining a literal dead end. Where the hell were you running to? You think just because you're a girl with magic abilities, you can just... Wait a minute. Transformations? Magic powers? Overly elaborate costume personas with code names? Fighting evil by literal, actual moonlight? Holy shit. This game's about magic girls. We're assembling a team of magic girls! My first impressions of Yeast Nine's gameplay were not good. You start off by strutting around offensively boring prison corridors, swinging a sword at the most generic fantasy creatures you can think of. Like, go ahead, what are the first three Costco brand early game monsters that pop into your head? Yeah, that's right, slime, furry woodland creature, oddly vaginal-toothed amphibian. 
Not gonna lie, it uh, kind of killed my enthusiasm. Luckily, it's not too long before you get your Magic Girl powers and things get markedly better. Yeast 9 leans on the action part of the action RPG moniker, meaning that you're gonna be doing a lot of stabbing. And my friends, the stabbing is good. There are six playable characters, each of whom have their own distinct roles and playstyles. You create a party of three and can switch between each of them with a single button press. Their normal attacks are broken into three different damage types that are strong against corresponding enemy types. This gives you incentive to build a diverse party and constantly switch between each of your characters for maximum effect. Or you could go the waifu route. God damn raging bull is thick though. I haven't seen a girl this stack since... Uh... The Monstrum can each be equipped with up to four special moves at a time that dole out death and move you through a fight in creative ways. Sometimes too creative. <laughs> These specials cost SP, indicated by this blue ring here, limiting your ability to just spam them to death. Unless, of course, you main White Cat, which I do. <laughs> New to Yeast 9, you have Boost, indicated by this red ring. Using Boost sends you into a roid rage, pumping up your character's raw stats and SP recovery rate. It can be activated at either 50 or 100%, and is a special finisher you'll want to use before the gauge zeroes out. A common pitfall of these kinds of combat systems is that they tend to feel a little button mashy, like you aren't really making any meaningful decisions in combat, a la Final Fantasy XV. And let's be clear, I loved Final Fantasy XV, but ultimately the combat consisted entirely of holding down the B button and the right trigger. But let's credit where credit is due, you hold down the right trigger too. That's true. However, thanks to the flash guard and flash move mechanics, East 9 mostly avoids this. With a perfect time guard, all your attacks temporarily become crits. And for a perfectly timed dodge roll, the enemy is briefly slowed, allowing you to shrug off all incoming attacks and just button mash the shit. Hey, what? While the combat is fast paced and incredibly fun, exploration quickly became my favorite aspect of Yeast 9. Each of the Monstrum bear a gift that enhances your traversal capabilities and makes navigating the spaces in the game actively fun. A dole gives you a DMC style grappling move that helps you zip line through the environments. The White Cat lets you Naruto run straight up walls, and Hawk lets you, uh, well, I mean, like, it's, it's in the name, right? Kaka! 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 From the moment I was let loose into the city with these first three abilities, I ran wild, poking my nose into all of its nooks and crannies. Not because Balduk is some open world masterpiece, quite the opposite, actually. It's ramshackle as shit. The street layouts are ripe with awkward spacings and poorly considered platforming, but it's just so full of stuff to find. Treasure chests tucked away in winding dead-end alleys, secret labs behind waterfalls, random-ass dungeons in the middle of the city. It feels rough, homemade, and honest. And I am here for it. This aesthetic did unfortunately lead to a number of cases of me trying to get to certain areas I could clearly reach, but the height or placement was off just enough to make it a chore. I was also able to use these abilities to reach areas of the game before I was meant to, or places I just wasn't intended to reach at all. And again, this may sound like a bad thing, but if it's really so bad, why am I having such a fucking good time? Bolduke isn't entirely opened up to you from the get-go. Its many districts are sectioned off by these magical barriers tied to the Grim World. As the plot progresses, you're given the opportunity to dismantle these roadblocks through the Grim World missions. These play out like a tower defense minigame. Waves of enemies spawn in, and it's up to you to stop them from destroying a... literal actual tower? You fight side by side with the rest of the Monstrum in these enthralling wave-based missions, and it's just so much fucking fun! 
Not gonna lie, the very first Grim World fight where you stand shoulder to shoulder with a full party of six and get to go ham, mobbing the unsuspecting Grim World demons to death was what hooked me. Dungeons are plentiful and tremendous in scale. Just like the main city, there's a ton of hidden away areas to discover. It was incredibly engaging to notice a treasure chest on my map and have no idea how I was supposed to get to it. The sub-game of assessing your environment and using your movement abilities to access less obvious areas was incredibly compelling. The bosses were, for the most part, entertaining. They each had interesting patterns they moved through and were still subject to your flash state, but definitely possessed a heightened level of challenge. I want to say that there were no damage sponges, but then I remember the spider. That thick bottom son of a bitch had me chopping away at its legs for what felt like 50 minutes. Burnt through every one of my healing items in that fight. Was there a strategy I was missing and just did it the hard way? I don't know, but when you give me eight spindly targets and the rest of the creatures out of reach, I can only imagine I meant to put on a flannel shirt and Paul Bunyan my way through those mofos. Oh my god, you guys, you guys, holy shit. Jesus fucking Christ. That was a nightmare. My palms are so sweaty. Holy shit. In addition to the host of collectibles and secrets scattered throughout Balduk's many districts, you'll find numerous side quests that allow you to unlock secondary party members that fill out your secret hideout as merchants and who also provide additional support during Grim World missions. BT Dubs, you have a secret hideout. It's a bar, NBD, BRB. What's kind of weird is that a lot of these side characters are totally missable, and yet their stories tie in directly with the main plot. So for no other reason than getting the full experience, I definitely recommend chasing down all the side quests. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine missing out on this botanist's... bottom-ist? In the immortal words of Davey504, if there's groove, I approve. If I'm being honest, in terms of graphics, Yeast 9 looks on par with the late stage PS2 title. There are numerous pop-ins and the draw distance certainly doesn't fall in line with what we've come to expect from modern PS4 games. Additionally, the animations are incredibly rigid. The way they all mechanically tilt and turn their heads as well as the funky little scissor walk they do when turning around looks ripped straight from Star Ocean till the end of time. And that's assuming they show an animation at all. Yeastine is not above pulling the old, uh, fade to black, sound effects, fade black in. Some cool shit totally just happened, guys, believe me! The environments are good for what they are. While there are a handful of beautiful outdoor locations, the majority of the game takes place within the muted city walls, the muted dungeons, and the muted prison. It's all very brown. While these aspects of the presentation are certainly noticeable and may be a deal breaker for some, I don't actually count them as negatives. Graphics, to me, are one of the least important parts of a game. I mean, Persona 5, if it looked the same as Persona 4, would still be a fantastic game. As long as the story's engaging and the gameplay is fun, I can forgive a lot. At the very least, the characters are colorful and creatively designed. Each of the Monstrum, as well as the other cast, have nice distinguishing features and the Magic Girl forms of your Core 6 are appropriately edgy without trying too hard. Only the Rat Tail accepted. <laughs> In case you haven't been listening, the music here fucking slaps. After some cursory research, it turns out that it's a pretty constant feature of most Falcom games, but goddamn if they don't knock it out of the park with this installment. But that being said, my research also turned up the fact that Falcom is well known for its high quality animated cutscenes. Cutscenes strangely absent from Yeast 9. Nothing when he started the game, nor at any major plot points or anything. Whether it was for budget or time reasons, all the game's animations were left on the cutting room floor. Again, nothing that'll straight up ruin the experience, but it is something longtime Falcom fans will certainly be missing. So on the end, guys, Yeast 9 is, let's call it rough. The animations look dated, the platforming can be janky, and it all feels just a little rushed. And I wouldn't change almost a thing about it. 
I can confidently say that I poured more hours into and had more fun with Yeast 9 than I did with Kingdom Hearts 3. And Yeast 9 didn't make me wait 10 years for a mid-core, incomplete pile of shit and then hold the real ending ransom for another 20 bucks! Kingdom Hearts 3 FUCKING SUCKS I CAN DIE IN A GODDAMN f- Alright guys, thanks for checking out my video. As always, special thanks to my Patreon subscribers, especially Sean Van Pelt, you champion. I got something special coming out for you real soon. Will all of you get to enjoy it, but it's it's at Sean's request, and I think it's turned out pretty great. So there's that. Subscribe, like, uh, yeah, check me out on Patreon if you want to support me here. Got some new, new stuff going up there real soon, I think. So uh, yeah, it's gonna be good. As always, thanks a lot, guys. Yep, yeah, bye.